what we have here is the Sphinx and you'll notice this wall of rock around it. You see this right here? This was the quarry, the Sphinx was quarried out of this rock and originally only its head was above ground. And what I'm showing here is a exhausted New Kingdom limestone quarry. Note the traces of the stepwise removed blocks. You see those lines where they've taken blocks away? In order to understand the process, look at this. Now this, this is a diagram showing how the Egyptians would quarry uh, rocks. They would create these separation trenches like this, and then when they would remove the rocks, then each layer of rock would leave this little stepped profile on the limestone wall. And this shows how the process proceeded. Um, they would create these separation trenches between the main mass of bedrock and the piece of rock that was going to be removed as a block. How, how would they chisel it out? They would use either picks or chisels, actually chisels. Yeah, in fact, I'm going to show you here, uh, let me jump ahead, right there, stone picks in a limestone quarry from about 1200 years BC. And you can actually, by when you look at the the, 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 the scarring left in the limestone wall, you can actually, they can tell what kind of tools were actually used. This was a pick. Here was no more picks. This is from the early New Kingdom, about 1500 years BC. It is limestone. Yes, I, I chose pictures of limestone to be com for an accurate comparison with the Sphinx. These are quarry faces exposed to the elements, and I want you to appreciate the fact that for 4,000 years, this has been exposed, and the erosion has been so minimal that you can still see the, the pick marks on the rock. But that's in Egypt where they get very little rain. Well, that's exactly right. So. And that's my point. You wouldn't have the, the same. Right. That, that's exactly, I mean, that's exactly my point, is that you've got, here you've got limestone rocks that were quarried, exposed to the elements for... 3,000, 3,500, and 4,000 years, and the erosion on those rocks is so minimal that the, that the pick marks are still visible in the faces. Okay, so now let's go back to this image here, and you can see here how, how the step profile is formed. Once the blocks are removed, there's a little bit of a step at each layer, and then they leave an exposed wall. Okay, now here's the rocks removed, and you can see the little the stepped profile there. All right. Pardon me. Why they removed it? Well, they take the blocks out to build temples out of them. It's a stone quarry, and they're cutting out these blocks, and then they take the blocks and they they build pyramids out of them, for example, or temples. Well, I can see how they get behind it, but how do they get underneath? Well, they, they chisel under it, they chisel holes through it, and in fact, they, they used some evidence that they had boring tools, and then they could use, they had ways of cracking the rocks. And, and generally what they would do is they would go down to a natural bedding plane. So you have a massive layer of rock, limestone, and then there'd be a bedding plane where it might separate a lot easier. And so that's where they would create their separation line. Okay, now let's look again at the picture of the Sphinx, and remember, you can see that there are blocks forming these temples to the east of the Sphinx, the remains of the ruins of these temples, and these blocks were taken from the area around the Sphinx body. So here's what you got to appreciate. The Sphinx is not a sculpture. I mean, it's a statue that was carved actually out of the bedrock. And the Sphinx is not freestanding, it's a part of the bedrock. It'd be like if we dug a pit and we dug a circular pit and left a column of earth standing in the middle. That's what they did here, you see. And then the evidence suggests that they took the limestone, built temples out of it, and then sheathed it with hard granite. But they did not sheathe the Sphinx, nor the quarry walls surrounding the Sphinx. And see, it's those quarry walls that tell the story. Now take a look. There's a photograph of the quarry wall 
behind the Sphinx and look at it. Does it look anything like the step profile of the, of the limestone quarry I showed you a picture of? Does it look anything like something that could have actual pick marks on it? No, it's, it's severely eroded and rounded, see? And that's what Schwaller de Lubitsch noticed, you know, back in the 1940s and, and, and what John Anthony West picked up on in the 1970s and Robert Schock picked up in the 1980s. Here's a profile through the west wall of the Sphinx enclosure showing the natural bedding planes. Right? And each one from 11, 56, 11, 76, these are numbered types of limestone. And there's a whole, some of them are harder, some of them are softer, they're of different ages, but these are the distinct layers of limestone. Now watch carefully here what I'm about to do. Us the material that's surrounding the Sphinx, this is a... Yes, this is a section through this wall right here. Different grades of limestone. There are different grades of limestone, yeah, like here's a layer, and there's a layer here, and a layer, yes, there's different grades of limestone, exactly. Exactly. Okay, so here's the profile taken essentially through one along this wall somewhere, and it's 22 feet from the top to the bottom. So we don't quite see the top up here, but if we look back here, the west wall is this wall back here, and it's 22 feet from the bottom of the enclosure up to the rim, up to the fence. Okay, so that 22 feet is shown right here. Now what we're going to do is we're going to superimpose the profile of a typical limestone quarrying operation onto the Sphinx profile. And you'll notice how some of the actual, in this hypothetical version, we actually have some of the block layers perfectly lining up with some of the bedding layers within the actual profile. But from this, and from this kind of a superimposition, we can get a sense of how much rock had been removed from the original face Let's picture, here come the stonemasons in, they quarry the blocks away to form the, the, the base of the sphinx. Then out of the block of the sphinx that they expose as they remove the surrounding rock, they then carve the sphinx. Outside the sphinx is the enclosure, which you saw the pictures of. That enclosure would show the evidence of the quarry. Because they took the blocks out, we can see the blocks. They're still there. They're sitting to the east of the east end of the Sphinx. But instead of seeing a typical quarry face, now we got to assume the oldest quarry face I showed you the picture of where we could see the pick marks was 4,000 years. The age, the conventional age of the Sphinx is 4,300 years. Okay, so how is it that we could have a quarry face 4,000 years old that still shows the pick marks but then we have the quarry face of the Sphinx, and, and we can see that in some cases here, there's up to perhaps two feet or more of original virgin rock that has been completely removed. Either we have it's much older or it's a lot of water. Yes. Did you hear what Paul said? Paul is on top of things tonight. Yes. So what, what I have done is I have gone to, and, and, and interestingly, when I uh, helped uh, host the, uh, the talk by Robert Schock three years ago in Asheville, the geologist, you know, who studied this, he had not gone into comparative erosion studies. He hadn't even done that. So what you're seeing here, as far as I know, no one has done. But you see, limestones are highly soluble in acid waters. However, they do not dissolve equally over their surfaces and the action of dissolution is usually concentrated down joints and fissures. Leads to the focusing of water into such joints and fissures. And if we look back at this diagram right here, that's exactly what we see. Like here's where water has been focused into a joint or a fissure. You can see this if you go cave exploring. Yeah. So here's a study that somebody did, um, okay, this is on a limestone cliff, profile of a limestone notch in the intertidal zone in Australia. Note positions, here's what they did. So are you saying that the water that was acid, that washed around the Sphinx? Well, yeah, it would have had acid in it. Which would come from? 
Well, rainwater is acidic. It's naturally acidic. Yeah, but to do that much damage, well, it's been a lot. Well, the damage could be, let's spend five minutes talking about that. Here's by comparison. Here is a limestone cliff profile against the ocean of, of Australia. Now, let's look at what's happening here. Let's look at what's happening. Um, zero is the extreme low water mark. And the high water mark uh, was up here somewhere, yeah. What they did was they drove iron pins into the, into the rock face. You know what the intertidal zone is? Between the low tide and high tide. So tw every 24 hours, the water is coming up, rising up. The surf is pounding against this limestone, and then the water goes down. So what they did was they measured the amount of erosion around each of these steel pegs over a period of uh, from 1953 to 1962. Let's see, yes. To obtain a direct measurement of rate of erosion, stainless steel rods were driven firmly into the hard rock of the notch in pairs at three levels above the platform. There has been no movement of the rods since they were placed in August of 1953. Now, what was the results of this? As they studied it, they discovered that at this level, the mean rate of erosion was one millimeter per year. A figure that again is very close to estimates from limestone shores elsewhere. So, uh, as a result of that, one millimeter per year, what does that work out to be? How, how is a thousand millimeters is how far? One meter, right? A meter, a meter is a thousand millimeters, right? So if let's assume conservatively that we have two feet removed from the, the wall of the Sphinx enclosure, based upon the amount of lime the amount of erosion that occurred on this comparable limestone face, in six hundred years of the ocean po surf pounding against it that would be equivalent to the amount of material removed from the Sphinx enclosure. To put that into perspective. Now that's a high energy environment. Another one, um, let's see. I've got a bunch of this and you can read. Uh, okay, in Geological Magazine for July 19, 1875, the writer of the present note gave some data bearing upon the rate of weathering of certain limestones. Uh, what he did was he went to dated tombstones. So you've got a limestone tombstone put into ground. I mean, isn't that ingenious? Yeah. Some guy dies in 1875, so you go there 20 years later or 30 years or 40 years, you know how long that, that tombstone has been exposed to the weather. Well, when the tombstone was placed there, it had inscriptions on it. And by studying how fast those inscriptions are erased, they can get a rate of erosion. And notice what he gave here. The mean of several observations gave as the rate of solution one inch in 500 years. Now, this environment is an environment with about 40 to 50 inches of rainfall per year. Like southeastern United States in a non-drought year has 40 inches of rainfall. So now, if you took a piece of limestone comparatively in, in hardness to the Sphinx limestone, and not in a desert environment like the Sphinx, but in a, a, a temperate wet environment like Georgia, say, with normal rainfall, the rate of erosion would be one inch in 500 years. If we assume 25 inches of erosion off of the Sphinx wall, how much is 25 times 500? So there's 12,500 years of erosion. In other words, Think about this, if we had comparable limestone here in Georgia, we quarried it out and we create a sphinx and we have a sphinx enclosure, it's 22 feet high and it's a, it's a quarried face with chisel marks still in it. 12,500 years later of rainfall in Georgia, you will perhaps remove two feet of, of limestone. 12,500 years. So you can see what we're getting at here. The United States Bureau of Standards has conducted experiments to ascertain the extent 
of the solubility of limestone in rainwater, two-inch cubes of rock were exposed on the roof of the Bureau's building at, at Washington. And after careful weighing spread over a period of about seven years, it was found that from exposure to the weather, an oolitic limestone would lose a layer about one millimeter in thickness in a hundred years. So you can see here what we're talking about. Um, the final one I'll show you, the final study was this right up here on the Tennessee River back in the 1940s. In 1912 through 1913, the Corps of Engineers constructed a navigation dike of large limestone boulders almost in midstream of the Tennessee River. When they built the Watts Bar Dam, they, they lowered, they built a coffer dam and lowered the, the level of the river and exposed the limestone blocks that had been immersed in the running water of the Tennessee River since 1913. So figure from 1913 to the early 1940s, these limestone blocks have been in the Tennessee River continuously washed by the water of the flowing river, right? And not exposed until, you know, 30 years, 27 years later. Yeah, they had, they had been in the river for 27 years. It is a dense, massive bedded, bluish gray, relatively pure limestone, blah, 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 blah. Uh, let's see. From this observation, one may predict that a limestone continually washed by Tennessee River water will dissolve at the rate of approximately one half inch in 25 years. Okay, now let's go back to our figure that we were using of 24 inches, say, of, of material removed from the Sphinx enclosure. At one half inch in 25 years, that's two inches in a century. So then 24 inches would be 12, 000, 1,200 years. So another way of looking at this is that if you picture the Sphinx enclosure, they've removed the rocks and here's the exposed virgin face of the limestone. In order to create an equivalent amount of erosion, imagine a river running over that for 1,200 years. Now you can begin to see the problem that is proposed, that is, we're presented with by the Sphinx. And it's just like Paul just said. Either, it's one of two things, either there was a whole lot more water or the Sphinx has got to be incredibly old. Incredibly old. So, how much is going to argue with you on that? Well, if they, if they were going to argue with me, I'd just present them with this data, and I'd say refute this data. But, I mean, here it is. I showed you the profile. You saw that yourself. 1,200 years older? No. Not, it's saying that it, you would have to run a river over the sidewalls of that quarry for 1,200 years. That doesn't mean that water was running over for 1,200 years. What I'm doing is trying to show up comparisons. I show one comparison was the, the intertidal surf, the waves coming up and washing against a limestone cliff. The other one was blocks of limestone just set out in a normal 40 to 50 inches of rainfall per year. The third example was an actual river and what running over a limestone block. And no matter which way we cut it, we're left with something either a very extraordinary water flow concentrated over a short period of time that was highly erosive or several, perhaps several flood events going back who knows how long. Well, see there, what we do, and we won't have time for that tonight. But what do you, what do you conclude? Do you conclude that it's much older or that there was some serious flooding there? Well, I'm still debating it myself, but I'm, I'm coming down on the side that it's probably at least 20 or 30 or 40,000 years old. Because then, because then we could perhaps have multiple flood events. Now, in order to answer that question, that was going to be where I basically went was, you know, here's the Nile, the Nile comes right up here, here's the Nile Delta, and here's the Eastern Mediterranean Basin. If you recall, it's the influx of fresh water leads to oxygen depletion in the salt, lower salt water, which creates these layers of sap repel. What we need is the studies of the sap repels, because every sap repel probably corresponds to a flood event. And I can show you, like here is one of the more recent studies on the sap repels in the eastern Mediterranean. And uh, this is what 
the author says. Here is the title of the article, which came out about 10 years ago, or even longer than that, two decades ago. It's entitled, this was in, in the prestigious journal of nature. It's entitled, After the Deluge, Mediterranean Stagnation and Sapropel Formation. In an eastern Mediterranean marine core, the upper sapropel begins soon after the start of a global event. A very heavy precipitation which occurred in the equatorial latitudes during the late glacial early Holocene. This heavy precipitation in Africa channeled by the Nile River across 35 degrees of latitude produced a low salinity surface layer in the eastern Mediterranean. In this confined basin with high bottom salinity, the steep gradient stratified the water column. The stagnant bottom waters triggered the sapropel formation. So in other words, they're saying right at the end of the glacier or early Holocene, there was this enormous, heavy, intense precipitation over northern Africa, and that precipitation washed a huge flux of fresh water into the eastern Mediterranean basin. Associated with that influx of fresh water was a whole lot of organic material settled to the bottom. The lid of fresh water on the salt water stopped the convection loop reduced the amount or eliminated the oxygen being carried to the bottom waters and now you had this layer of rotten mud that formed on the bottom. Now that's the uppermost one but under that as you core down there are multiple other layers down below it and each one of those probably indicates some kind of a flooding event perhaps going back hundreds of thousands of years. So you know how you correlate this my guess is that the Sphinx Sat was sitting there on the Giza Plateau when this event right here happened. And notice the date that she gives, um, 12,500. So that's right in the interval that we've been learning about in here. You know, when this whole global upheaval occurred during the age of Leo. It sent higher rainfall in Ethiopia, sent extraordinary floods down the main Nile, marking a revolutionary change. So that's kind of the background on the Sphinx. Let me just do a little summary of some of the stuff we've been talking about in here. We have learned that at this point, hopefully, you've got the understanding that, that the science behind catastrophism is very real, it's very sound, and it's almost irrefutable at this point. The other thing is, is that we know that there's and we haven't really even gotten into this aspect of it yet, but it appears as if the catastrophes are cyclical or periodic in nature. And that the evidence for that is coming from two directions. One, the science is showing, just like, for example, I mentioned the layers of sapropel. It's very likely that as we get better and better dates on those layers of sapropel, we're going to see that there's a tempo at work there. But from many different fronts, the scientific front is suggesting a periodicity. The ancient tradition also suggests a periodicity. And when we start talking about the concepts of the great year, now we're getting into this, the ancient notion of cyclical disasters. And what we're seeing now is that the ancient notion of disasters and the modern, the new catastrophism are converging into a single paradigm about Earth history. And the result being that it appears as if there is a regular ongoing tempo, tempo of, of catastrophes. We now know that human beings have lived through probably at least 10 or 12 catastrophes, which if they were repeated today could end civilization. We've also seen evidence that there was very advanced knowledge at the very dawning of, of recorded history. Now, up to this point, Conventional science has dismissed derisively the idea of ancient civilizations, of, being, of having any scientific advancement or knowledge or whatever. And they'll usually cite, they'll usually then demand that you present hard evidence that such a civilization would have existed. 
in the form of some kind of remnant infrastructure. Well, what we now know about the, the durability of the artifacts of mo our own modern civilization is that 10,000 years from now, none of it would exist except for what? The two things listed on that recent documentary was Mount Rushmore and the Great Pyramids. So, I mean, they're interestingly and ironic, the Great Pyramids, if, like the legends say, you know, Sargon the king had foreknowledge that there was going to be this great event and a great flood, so he built the pyramid to, to last through that flood. Well, from what we've just talked about with, with, with the evidence for the scale of erosion on the Sphinx, there must have been some pretty damn extraordinary floods in northern Africa and in Egypt, you know, at the end of the last ice age. Now, if you had a normal building of blocks that were manageable by normal humans that might weigh up, up to, let's say at the top end, a half a ton or a ton. The kind of flood we're talking about isn't going to leave those rocks behind. W when we look at the slides that you've seen of these big erratic boulders that were carried in the, in the Snake River flood, some of those are probably 50 to 100 tons or more. Do you see? So how long would a two-ton, even a two-ton rock, last in a flood flow like that? it would be completely swept away and destroyed and you wouldn't be able to, if there was a remnant of it, you couldn't tell the difference between that and just a natural rock that had been caught up in the floodwaters. The only thing that's going to endure are the megalithic stones, the stones that are w way big, 100 tons, 200 tons, or a structure that's still rooted as part of the bedrock like the Sphinx was. If we knew that there was going to be a massive flood coming through here, and we wanted to create a monument that could endure to that flood and serve as a marker for a future civilization, we could do no better than to carve a structure right out of the solid bedrock, just like Mount Rushmore is part of the actual mountain. Or the face on Stone Mountain. Sure, or the face on Stone Mountain. They didn't mention that, but that might actually still be there too as well. But you get the point. And all over the world, interestingly, we find in Cuzco, in Baalbek, on Malta, in Egypt, in England, we find these gigantic blocks of stone that would be totally inconsistent with any assumption that farmers, subsistence farmers, would be quarrying 100-ton blocks of stone. As a builder, I know that trying to move something that's 1,000 pounds is a major big deal. A half a ton. Why would I... If I was a farmer, why in the hell would I want to quarry a stone 50 or 100 tons and move it miles? <laughs> well, I mean, it's clear to me, I think, that we're looking at the, the, the handiwork of, of some civilization that has existed and whose basically almost all trace of has disappeared except for things like megaliths. And that's all that we would expect to find. Except that the other way that that civilization still exists and endures is through the legends and the epic tales and through the customs that have been handed down, the mythology and so forth. And really, that tells a whole story. And here's the story it tells people. It tells that we human beings have somehow managed to survive these events that whole other species such as of, of the... Of the capabilities of a mastodon or a woolly mammoth were not able to survive. Somebody raised a question at one of the recent talks, maybe it was here, as to, well, there isn't the question really how did people survive some of these events? The Pleistocene Holocene boundary saw the extermination of perhaps as many as 20 million woolly mammoths worldwide. And of course, now here this has always been attributed to, to the Clovis hunters. Can you imagine what, I mean, these, think about this. What were these like? Think about the appetites of these people. Ten thousand of them come across the Bering Land Bridge, and in a thousand years, they've eaten twelve million mammoths. <laughs> and that's what the paleontologists would want us to believe, because they're scared shitless of the idea of facing the reality that there was a catastrophe. So here we've got. I've tried to show you that there is evidence that the catastrophes have taken the forms of great floods that the catastrophes have taken the form of, of great fires, and that logically what we have to attribute these catastrophes to, if we want to come up with, to me, plausible explanations, is we have to look outside. We have to look exogenically outside to the cosmic domain. And this is now where I believe 
here's what's converging. We have evidence that, that there has been a transmission of knowledge from the antediluvian times down to the present day. And I always liken this transmission of knowledge to an underground stream or an underground river which occasionally surfaces, people can drink from it, and then it goes back underground again to conceal itself. But it's the same stream of knowledge, whether it was the, whether it was the knowledge and the know-how that built the Gothic cathedrals, or that built the Sumerian ziggurats, or the Great Pyramids, it's the sing or, or, or Stonehenge, or any of the rest, it's a single stream of knowledge coming from one ultimate source. Somebody who had advanced scientific knowledge, whose, whose origins go way back so deep into the Ice Age that we don't even know where they are. Now, it brings us up the other question, which is the question that I want to start addressing from here on out, is what is this what is this line of knowledge? How has it been preserved? Who's been responsible for preserving it? And what happened to these people? See, there's, you have to understand that when you're looking at the Great Pyramid at the very dawn of civilization, here is advanced knowledge of geometry, astronomy, geodesy, engineering, etc., etc., etc. Perhaps the control and manipulation of energy, which is another thing we've ba basically just scratched the surface of, the possibility of that there being a science of energy control involving these great stones and involving the structure of the landscape and the passage of the heavens. If this is true, this is an extremely sophisticated knowledge, perhaps knowledge that could be very important for our own future survival, if that's in fact what they were doing. But what we have is that it would seem that somebody had command of this knowledge and they were able to preserve this knowledge while everyone else, they not only preserved this knowledge, but they were able to do so when virtually everybody else perished in these catastrophes. And so I think that when we look at these catastrophes and we look at the evolution of modern societies around the world, what we're seeing is a pattern that's consistent with this. There were two types of survivors. The survivors who survived through luck because they were in the right place at the right time, and these people, because they were essentially unprepared, had to deal with the environmental and ecological disruptions associated with these catastrophes and therefore were wholly preoccupied with the, uh, with, the, with the problem of survival. On the other hand, you had somebody with the capability of preserving advanced scientific knowledge and then organizing people and building a 480 foot tall pyramid, for example. These were the people who survived by intention. They survived because it was their intention and their plan to do so. And it's as these people, whoever they were, that spawned the whole occult tradition of, you know, this transmission of, of hidden knowledge down through the ages. Until such time as the next episode would be upon us and that knowledge would become essential to the human survival. And that, I think, is the time we're at right now. And from here on, we turn and we begin to look at that legacy and we begin to see that it has very detailed blueprints for, for modern man. The Gothic cathedrals are detailed blueprints for what we do next. And here's the final thing I'm going to say. I want you to start thinking about the message of the Ande Stone. The message of the Ande Stone is that it is written that life takes refuge in a single space. We'll talk about that. We'll go, we're going to go back and I promise we're going to finish with the X Factor because here's where the X Factor actually ties in. The X Factor connects us with this, this stratum of knowledge. There's somebody who knows more than we do. Than we do. Okay. okay. Very good. <laughs> All right, thank you.